In the previous screencast, we discussed electromagnetic radiation and how those waves can behave like particles, called photons. A French scientist named Louis de Broglie began to wonder if electromagnetic radiation could behave like particles, could matter behave like waves? And in 1924, he proposed his wave hypothesis. He proposed that electrons moving around the nucleus could be considered like waves rather than particles. So you'll notice in this diagram in the lower right-hand corner, this circle on the outside represents the orbit proposed by Bohr's model, and this darker black line represents the electron traveling around that orbit where it moved much like a wave rather than following a smooth circular path as Bohr had proposed. He further hypothesized that the wavelength of an electron, or any other type of matter, depends on its momentum. He was able to support his hypothesis mathematically using this equation. Momentum is calculated by multiplying mass times velocity of any particle of matter. Remember that h is Planck's constant, and lambda is the wavelength of a wave. De Broglie's equation shows that momentum and wavelength are inversely proportional. If you have a particle, like an electron, whose mass is very, very small, its wavelength will be very large, and it will have a noticeable wave-like motion around the nucleus. On the other hand, if you had a particle the size of a baseball, its mass would be much larger, and therefore its wavelength would be significantly smaller. So small, in fact, that its wavelength is undetectable because its mass is so large. De Broglie's hypothesis was later supported by experimental evidence several years later and is the basis for electron microscopes that are used in biology. An electron microscope works by shooting a beam of electrons through a crystal or some other specimen. That beam of electrons is scattered or diffracted by the object, just like a wave would, and this produces an image that you can see. In 1926, Erwin Schrödinger, an Austrian physicist, incorporated both the wave-like behavior and the particle-like behavior of electrons to predict where an electron would likely be found. In doing so, he created a mathematical equation that laid the foundation for quantum theory. You can see his equation right here. It incorporates a lot of complicated calculus, so we won't be using it in class, but I thought it would be neat to show you. The quantum theory of matter, also known as quantum mechanics, allows physicists and other scientists to explain the behavior of subatomic particles better than Isaac Newton had described in his laws of motion known as Newtonian physics. Ultimately, what Schrodinger's wave equation allows us to do is describe the probable location of electrons. He was able to determine that electrons do not travel in two-dimensional orbits, like Niels Bohr had suggested, but rather in three-dimensional orbitals. And this graph over here on the right, if the intersection of the x and y axis is the nucleus of the atom, all of these dots represent the probable location that an electron might be around that nucleus. This three-dimensional region is known as an orbital. Finally, in 1927, a German physicist named Werner Heisenberg proposed his uncertainty principle. By this point in time, Scientists knew that it was possible to determine the momentum of an electron. That was originally proposed by de Broglie. Scientists also knew that it was possible to calculate an electron's position at any point in time using Schrodinger's equation. What Heisenberg proposed was that it's impossible to know both the momentum and the position of an electron at the same time. The reason this is is because in order to measure the position of an electron, you have to strike it with light and the photon from an electromagnetic wave will strike the electron and be reflected up to a microscope where you can observe it. However, in the process of striking the electron, the path and the velocity of the electron will change depending on the energy of the light. So if the electron was originally following this curve, it's now going to go off in some other direction, but that new direction and momentum of the electron will be unknown. So in the end, we have no idea where an electron is at any point in time. We only have an estimate of where it's most likely to be around that nucleus. In order to identify the location of an electron, we need to use values called quantum numbers. 
A quantum number specifies the properties of an orbital and the location of its electrons. So it's kind of like the physical address of any electron in an atom. There are four types of quantum numbers. The first type is called a principal quantum number. The principal quantum number indicates the main energy level of an electron. These were actually first proposed by Niels Bohr. Remember that electrons can move between different orbits from their ground state to these excited states. And he represented those energy levels as n equals 1 or n equals 2. And that n represented the principal quantum number. As n increases, or as the principal quantum number increases, so does the amount of energy and distance from the nucleus. You can see here in the picture on the left that this orbital is very small, and so this is considered a 1s orbital, with 1 being the principal quantum number. In the middle is a 2s orbital. Notice it has the same shape, but it's a little bit larger. And on the far right is a 3s orbital, and again that 3 is the principal quantum number, is much larger than either of the previous two. The second type of quantum number is called an angular momentum quantum number, and this indicates the sublevel or shape of the orbital. It is generally represented with a letter. There are four different sublevels or shapes that any orbital can have. There are s orbitals, which have a spherical shape represented here in red. There are p orbitals, which are described as a dumbbell shape, kind of looks like a figure eight. There are also d orbitals, which I like to think of as clover shaped. And finally, there are f orbitals, which have all kinds of different shapes, but generally look like flowers. Now there's a pattern between the principal quantum number and the angular momentum quantum number. If the principal quantum number is one, then there is only one sublevel or one shape that can exist, and that is a sphere. If n equals two, then there are two sublevels or two shapes that an orbital can have. It can either be an S, which is spherical, or it can be a P, which is dumbbell shaped. If n equals three, then there are three possible shapes, S, P, and D. So spherical shaped, dumbbell shaped, or clover shaped orbitals. And if n equals 4, there are four possible shapes, s, p, d, and f. So spheres, dumbbells, clovers, and flowers. The third type of quantum number is called a magnetic quantum number. And it indicates the orientation of the orbital. So it tells you which direction that orbital is pointing in three-dimensional space. An s orbital is spherical shaped. Because it's a sphere, it can only point in one direction. It doesn't matter how you rotate that sphere, it's always going to be oriented the same direction in three-dimensional space. However, a p orbital can point in three different directions. So it can be oriented in three different ways. It could be along the x-axis, it could be along the y-axis, or it can be along the z-axis. A D sublevel can have five different orientations. It can be along the axes, it could be between the axes, or it can have this odd donut shape. And finally, an F sublevel can actually have seven different orientations. Now, usually we represent these orientations by dashed lines or boxes in orbital diagrams. So remember that S can only have one direction, so we would just use one box or one line. P's can point three different directions, so they will have three boxes or three lines. D's have five different orientations, and F's have seven different orientations. There is also a pattern between magnetic quantum numbers and the principal quantum number. The total number of orbitals in each energy level is equal to n squared. So if the energy level is one, there's only one orbital present, and that would be spherical shaped. If n equals 2, 2 squared is equal to 4, so there are four different possible energy levels, 1s and 3ps. If n equals 3, 3 squared is equal to 9, and there are nine different orbitals that can exist in the atom, 1s, 3ps, and 5ds. And finally, if n equals 4, 4 squared is 16, and there are 16 different orbitals that would exist at that energy level, 1s, 3ps, 5Ds, and 7Fs. 
The last quantum number is called a spin quantum number, and this indicates the direction of an electron spin. So electrons actually spin upon their axes just like the Earth does, and they can spin in a clockwise direction or a counterclockwise direction, usually described as up or down in chemistry. When we draw orbital diagrams, we represent the spin of an electron by using arrows. Each orbital, which remember is represented by a box or a line, can hold two electrons, and those electrons will have opposite spins, one with an upspin and one with a downspin. We'll learn how to draw these orbital diagrams in the next screencast.